Hey everybody, welcome to Woodworking Wisdom. My name's Colin Way. I do apologise, I'm a little bit bunged up this morning. There's a little bit of, uh, I think it's hay fever in the air. I think that's what uh, that's the reason. Uh, today it's all about uh, salt pepper grinders. We're going to be using the wood, new woodcut mill drill, um, but we're also going to be using these mechanisms, crush grind mechanisms. And uh, these are one of my favourite, just because of the quality really, the quality of build on them. Um, we're going to do this size. Okay, which is the 130 mil, that being the 190. And just briefly, whilst we're there, let me just give you a quick look. This is the 190 version, but there's the mill drill neatly tucked inside. And if I pull the top off, that's where you fill it. Okay, and then the end is in there. So it's a nice, neat little job. I've got some laminated blanks that I've done prior, and these are just a few that I've been playing with. Um, last week just to get uh, the demo right for you so just some different shapes and, and sizes that's all so uh, yeah there we are just to uh, give you an idea we'll play around with these as we go through the demo but there's my blank i've got a 180 mil blank in terms of length and that's going to be used on the 130 let me just get this one out for you there we go the 130 uh mil Crush grind mechanism. I brought this one really. This is one of the new additions, or not new additions. This is the mini crush grind mini. Now you can clearly see that there is a difference in diameter there. Okay. Now that before now, it's you weren't able to um, cater for that mini in the mill drill itself. Now you can. There's an extra set of holes here and an extra position for the bottom cutter that would allow you to do the mini as well. So this little um this little mechanism or this little grinder is actually catered for the mini so you get much smaller hole in the bottom to cater for that smaller size look okay so that's the ability of this one i will just explain what the mill drill uh does so the reason for, for doing this it cuts the two holes at the same time so in uh all of the crush grinds you've got a staggered hole um, if i could show you this one if we can get right on the inside of this one there we are you may just be able to work out that there's a little ridge there. Okay, so we've got two holes. So if you were using sawtooth bits, which you need for end grain uh, drilling, we'd have one, two, uh, three drill bits that end, and then another uh, drill bit for this end. So we're only now um, needing just, uh, oh, well, I'm going to use four, uh, two drill bits uh, in total, one for the small at the top um, and one for that main uh, center hole. So it just cuts down a little bit. Uh, bear in mind that the, whatever drill you use needs to be a fair quality if you're going to use a few of them or if you're going to make a few of these projects. You need a good quality sawtooth forstner bit as opposed to a regular cutting force in a bit. Let's get clear on that. A regular cutting force in a bit, so we know saw teeth on the end there for side grain. Sawtooth uh, force in a bit, so for end grain, they have those little saw teeth that chisel out the end grain where cutting force cut the fibers as they go through. So they're not really intended for for uh, for end grain, those those cutting fibers. Uh, just to let you know, we've got Ben on the uh, the, the techery, the switchery, um, switching cameras and asking questions and all those sorts of things. So you know what to do. Just give us a shout. If there's anything you didn't, didn't understand or questions you want to ask, please do. Uh, Ben's there to do that. Uh, so laminated blanks, like I said. So there we are. This is just a bit of scrap wood. Uh, I say scrap wood many bits of scrap wood put together. You could do this as many times as you want. I didn't follow a pattern. It's just a thing that I've just glued bits together, planed in between, so we've got good bearing surfaces. Um, and uh, yeah, just hope for the best. I have no idea what comes out. It's a little bit like a Christmas present. You don't know what you get until you, you unwrap it. So we'll see. I quite like that. It's quite exciting. But you could go as intricate with your laminations. You could go as basic. You could just do two, uh, two pieces of timber if you wanted to. You get a yin and a yang or something like that. But it's all up to you, okay? These were offcuts uh, from Nathaniel's uh, Union Jack platter. So we had a lot of different bits of uh, timber left over from that. So I grabbed them and, and, uh, and glued them together for this project. So it's quite nice. Uh, what tool rest do we need? Let's go that size there. Okay. And all I'm going to do initially is just rough down to a cylinder. Ben, would you grab me from the, the cabinet just some of those little ear foam ear plugs, please? Only for no reason at all. It's my ears are a little bit sensitive nowadays, so I like to wear some ear plugs. 
Go in, not reverse. Mystery hand coming out. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so just little foam ear plugs. Look, I'm just using those just to protect my my ears. One of those in each ear. When it comes to doing the drilling later, you can get a little bit of noise from the drilling, uh, but this is just general general turning noise that I've just tried to minimize. Uh, we're going to rough down to a, a near cylinder first. I'll do that around about 15 to 1600. Now that's okay for the roughing down at the moment. We've still got square uh, faces or some square edges on there. Look, you can see here those two edges. But what I'm going to do is just put a little uh, a little foot in there for our chuck. And I'll use the C jaws just to hold for drilling. And I'm just going to do a little recess, little foot there, just to get down to that full round. That one there. And then we're good. Okay. The other thing now, so we're using the 130 mechanism. I need to just measure up where I'm going to cut this. So I'm going to, I need to have a grab from the top. So I need to have that grabbing the shaft here. So I'm just going to measure because I'm going to actually going to cut this in half for the, for the top. So I need this section going into the top. So let's go. Let's go there. That's going to be where we cut off. Yes, Ben, you got a question there. Yeah, we've got a question here uh, from from Ward. He's asking, what type of live centre is that? Live centre. So this is a, a little ring centre. So we've got. I just show you Ward. This one out there. So I'll show the camera. It's just a little single point surrounded by that that ring. So there we go. See a little ring. You've got a little few nicks and dings and stuff like that in it, but it's got a single point with a ring. Whee, all, right. all right, so there we are. So a little ring center. And we're using a, a pro drive, so a sprung pro drive in the headstock. So look, now I've done, I've measured where I want that to, to be. Uh, if you're doing a lot of these, you keep that measurement, obviously repeat it. Uh, but I'm going to part through this in a moment. So what I need to do is change that line into my parting cut little bit of space oh, that'll do and we are going to part this down in a minute oh sorry we're going to rough it down in a second but just for the moment whilst i can i'll just put a little pencil line there just to tell me where the center is or where they come in, came apart. So I want to make sure that I rejoin them in the same way and not flip this inadvertently and have that joining on. Otherwise, the grain will never match up. So it's just like making a pen, basically. I've done that. We can now saw. So I'm going to release a little bit of pressure. Uh, rather than trying to part through, when you've got two points sort of pushing toward you and you try and part through this area, all that's going to happen is suddenly you get a bind and things have you know, come off at, at uh, force. So I'm going to get to that point and then cut... The other side, same thing. There we are. We're through. Then you can release the pressure and pop them off. Okay, so that's what we need to rejoin. So now I've got a good hole point for my chuck this side so I can drill through a hole and I've got the same on this side. Again, I can drill through where I need to on that one. We're going to have a mortise and a tenon or sorry, a mortise and a tenon to rejoin them so they stay nice and central uh, when they're being operated. And the mill drill is going to work in this side here. Okay. Um, so we know what we're doing now-ish. Yes, Ben. Um, so just a question from, from Ward again. He was asking about the um, 
the, the live center is it spring loaded the lies yes oh sorry <laughs> the the live in the tailstock uh, oh at the tailstock no it's just just a, a regular solid uh, oh, it's on a bearing um but it's just a ring around that center point so that the little center point sort of goes into the timber the ring then creates that that round what it does ward it just stops any splitting potential splitting or the center sinking in too deep if it's a very punky timber uh, that's the only reason for it. If I was using a single point, you see, sometimes with the summer growth and, and winter growth, it'll tend to veer off to one side. Uh, so that's the reason I use it. It just, just minimizes that that um, sort of penetration. And then a question from Nick. He says someone's given them a whole pile of Scandinavian redwood. Um, it seems very soft. Is it any good for turning or better off in the fire pit? Any tip is good for turning. It depends what you want to do with it. So what is the what project do you have in mind to use it on, for instance? So if you wanted to practice with it, if you wanted to make some practice pieces, practically, practically spindle turning, that sort of thing, perfect. Um, you could make the mushrooms with it if it's a little uh, sort of branch section. Yeah, so there's lots of things you could do with it. Um, we use Scandinavian redwood for joinery. Um, and I use that for making uh, uh, table lamps, you know, for practicing my uh, skew work, and all those sorts of things. So yeah, there's there's some there's some youth, uh, use in it. Um, but you know that uh, the downside or the good side is if you, do, if you know, whatever you make, if you want to get rid of it, then the fire pit is the best place for it. I was only you doing that on the weekend, actually, burning some uh, some old bowls. Uh, right, so Chuck can go on now. We're going to need the tailstock in a minute, so um, I'm going to remove that that center. My ring's gone. A minute, I forgot that before I started. So they come off in the, in the pocket, just in case. Uh, we're going to use seed jaws on this one. So let's go with our little, little SK100. And we'll do the first job, actually, will be just drilling out that center hole of this blank. So this is the bottom. So we'll do that first. I've got some wax on standby in case we get too much uh, too much friction from this, as in noise friction sort of thing. I need a drill chuck in there. And a 25 or one inch drill bit. And all I need to do is just go past halfway. So if we work out where halfway is, if I go up to, let's go up to my black line on my drill bit. Look, I've already sent it up, so I know where the center is. I'm going to be drilling about 900 revs. There we are. One hand on the chuck all the time. Get myself maximum trouble. There we go, nice. Clear that swarf regularly, so back you come. Sometimes on that retrieval, that's where you'll get a little bit of vibration, and that will show itself in the way of um, a lot of noise. So you've got to keep clearing the swarf. What happens, if you don't clear the swarf on these types of cutters, the swarf will build up behind the cutter head and then expand, and so it'll block the cutter in. Even though it'll be slopping around, it'll still be blocked in there because there's so much swarf behind it backed up. So do keep clearing that swarf. It's got to go somewhere. If you think there's nothing coming out at the moment, it's just building up. There we are. That can come out now. So we've drilled part way. I want to turn it over and drill the rest of the way. But if I just turn this over as is, there's potential that that will be slightly off because I've got no reference point. This is wobbling about a little bit. This is not a clean surface. So before we go any further, I'll do exactly the same. I'll take the opportunity just to clean that edge as my reference now, my new reference. So same thing. Just with the parting tool. Let 
clean that surface. And whilst I'm there, while I can, let's just clean the other surface, so the front face. Make every bearing surface a good one. There we go. Now I'm going to put a C there. Okay, that's for center. Now we're going to drill all the way through. There we are. We've hit that center hole. Again, I'm going to clean up that bottom edge. So we've got a neat hole. Now, we're left, if you remember, that was the center, okay? So now we're left with what is the bottom of our pepper grinder so I can change things over so the the grinder now is in there that way around look that being the center so now I'm free to turn the two holes here with my um, my uh, mill drill so we're going to do that now we're going to make those two holes so we'll get the mill drill in. yes Ben you got a question so yeah a couple of questions here Cohen um, first one from Malcolm. He says he has an Axminster SK114. Yeah. Um, it has two tapped holes in the back and no locking ring. Can a ring be made to fit into these holes and lock the chuck for reverse turning? No, is the very, very short answer to that one. Those two tapped holes in the back were for uh, locking on to the lathe, but they're done in compression. So what they're designed to do... And, oh, I haven't got one here. What they're designed to do, if you um, undo the jaws, you'll see through the chuck those the, to access those points. They are designed actually to uh, bed a, against the bearing surface on the lathe. You put pressure, so it's pressure against the thread. Not my most favourite way of, of locking onto a lathe, if I'm honest. If you, unless you have the extended nose version, which has two side locking holes, the holes, uh, and then again they pinch onto the uh, to the uh, register of the lathe, uh, which you know is, is tried and tested. That's been done for for years. The only issue that again I have, if you're doing some heavy reverse turning, there is a tendency for it to slip, and you can start damaging threads and that sort of thing. The 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 best way by far is the locking ring, but not everybody's got that ability. Not everybody has a lathe that has that function on it. So um, it's one of those three options will work. Um, and the 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 best um, in order would be this one, then the uh, uh, side grub screws, and then the third would be the end grub screws. All right. And then um, a question from Edinator. They're asking, um, is there a situation where you would use long hole boring kit for these? No. Um, no. No? No, again, sure, because long hole boring kits uh, involve going through something, going through a center. Um, the only ones I know is just, just traditionally has been 5 sixteenths. They may try and uh, metric uh, size them now, but 5 sixteenths have been the only size. And then that's far too small. So that's good for a cord size, for lamp boring and stuff like that. There's nothing I know that has this size um, of drill bit available to it. And then with the long hole boring, um, is, is, it, um, is there any need to clean out the tailstock or shaft um, before and after constantly do that uh, what you'll find even with um so a long hole boring uh a center like this one which has little exhaust ports uh, on it so as those shavings get created it flies out of those shavings those uh, holes even still even some will come back on the uh the auger a little bit um, and then that can block. So, yeah, constantly do it. If you're doing a lot of labs, constantly clean through, a little bit of rolled up newspaper, 
you know, and shove that up there and get that clean or some brushes, that sort of thing. That will clean it out regularly. Uh, but yeah, that, that is a constant um, part of the lane maintenance when you're doing that type of thing. Yes. And then the last one for now, Colwyn. Uh, Callum's asking, uh, well, he says, hi, Colwyn. They have a barrel that's 18 inch diameter by 12 inch deep. Should they rough it out? Um, rough it out as normal to dry. I would try and save as much of it as possible, if I'm honest. If you could do, uh, if you have a bowl saver, a coring system, that sort of thing, uh, or no, have a friend that has one, I would try and save as much of it as possible because it's gold, really. Any barrels or uh, anything like that. So if you could, but yeah, if, if you're thinking about rough turning, it has to be, or sorry, if you think about bowls, it will have to be rough turned first. Well, not, it doesn't have to be, but you're, you're, you're less of the amount of movement you'll stop the splitting even though the grains everywhere so you'll have lots of little um, splits rather than big ones um, but it's the drying time you'll have it ready to return within a few at most uh you know a couple of years but i would have thought a, a year would have seen it dry um so yeah rough turn uh core if you can uh, but yeah, treat it like, just like timber. It, it, it because with burrs, the the grain is literally swirling all over the place. So you don't get the grain in one one uh, plane. So you don't get the big splits so or uh, fall in half that sort of thing. It will just split all over the place. Uh, but it'll dry quicker if you if you uh, rough turn it. Yes. Right, I'm going to be drilling here again about eight to nine hundred. I waxed the end because there is a little bit of friction as it goes into the hole my drill point for this size of uh of, of mechanism is up to the end of this area here okay if we were doing the the mini it would be up to here but we're doing the larger one so it's at this point is where i have to go into so away we go so get nice and close i have wax do not put your hand here now when you're doing this this will spin to start with and these are cutters and they won't stop cutting just because your hand's there, okay? A little bit of pressure. There we are. So you can see that shaving coming away from the bottom. Turn that a little bit. So we're going to start cutting the second hole in a moment. There we are, second hole being cut now. There we are, to our depth. There we are, and I can unwind. I tend to stop the lathe to unwind. It just stops breakout as you reverse back out again. There we are. Now, let me just... We're going to turn it over. Uh, I'll show the camera a minute. Oh, I've got a little bit of cleanup to do with that. I'm a bit burred over. Let me just get some abrasive in there and clean up before I... I want to show you whilst it's, when it's looking good, not when it's raggedy. So that's just like any, uh, any sort of uh, breakout that you get when you come off the end grain. You just need to clean it off. And that's going to impede the... The uh, mechanism putting it in as well, so I need to get rid of that. So, that's got it good, right? Uh, let's go above, Ben. Let's see if I can get that central. There we are. So you can see the ridge in there now. We've got the two holes nicely. We've got the center hole. What I'll do now is turn it over one more time because we've got to do the recess for, or the mortise rather, for the top of the mech. That's going to hold. 
if it's got a mechanism in, but this is the little mortise here. Okay, that's going to take the actual lid itself. So that slots in and just slots in there nicely and allows it to twist. So that's in this end here. Yes, Ben, another question. Um, so we've got a few questions coming, Cohen. First one from Callum. He's asking, have you ever poured clear resin inside a bowl or a vase to form a coating? Um, seen it done on videos. Your thoughts on that? Well, we were talking about that in the in the resin frog the other day, actually, whether we use timber as a, uh, sorry, resin as a, a sort of sealer. Uh, yeah, it works. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure whether I want to be drinking out of it. I can't see, I don't know of any issues. Um, uh, but sort of, certainly for things that are going to uh, vase shape, so that sort of thing that are going to uh, hold water, I can't see an issue with it. I think it would probably be a, a good thing. Funny, I was looking at some plant pots the other day, and we're, uh, I was also uh, talking at what well, I can't remember what woodworking wisdom it was about sealing things like whiskey, uh, whiskey uh, tumblers and, and wine glasses in the old fashioned way, you know, the, the way the Coopers. Uh, seal the inside of, of whiskey barrels and wine barrels by burning the inside. And uh, they had in this garden centre, they had some barrels, uh, uh, some plant pots made out of old barrels and that you could see the charring on the inside where they were waterproofed um, uh, in their manufacture. So that was quite a good way. But no, I think resin would work because it is a, a seal. It creates that, uh, that barrier. So yeah, no problem with that. And then Edinate is asking, um, was it... Um micro crystalline wax or machine wax used on the cutter oh anything whatever uh, uh don't use i wouldn't go machine wax i'd probably go uh micro crystalline that wasn't that was was it no yes it was that was a micro crystalline but I, it's just because it was the closest one to me <laughs> um any of your wood waxes would do the job um because it is literally just a uh, a lubricant and there shouldn't be any residue left really and then a question from our friend Martin. Um, he's saying, hi, do you know if the chestnut lemon oil is food safe? I don't know for sure. Have a look on their, their cost sheets. I would have thought so because it's just a citrus oil. Um, I would have thought so. Check for, for on their cost sheets. So like I say, but uh, certainly it would be, a, a, a for me, an oil of choice or things like fruit bowls, salad bowls, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I know the the Hampshire Sheen one here. Um, I, I'm, again, I'm happy with using that on on uh, salad and fruit bowl, so no problem. Yeah, um, I'm just going to do a, a mortise for here, no given depth. that one back out again so let's have a quick look at that so then what i have i've got the top that's going to be the mortise and then this is the bottom that's where the me mechanism goes so that blank is now ready so uh, you know this screams out for what well, for me it screams out uh, production doing a few at a time if you're going to make one you may as well make a few okay so that's that bit done next thing we want to look at what will be the top. So this has a little bit of prep to do as well. I have to first of all make the mortise that's gonna sit in there nicely, okay? And also we wanna make a, uh, a recess and a hole ready to accept this section, okay? This, if I take that off, that has to sit inside there nicely to accept the, the, uh, the actual uh, barrel here. Uh, and that's how you get that twist mechanism. So that's got to go in there. I'm going to start off with a 22 mil drill bit on there. I'm not actually going to use the the mill drill for this. And if you had um, the right size drill bit, I could have housed that within the mill drill. I don't. All of mine are mixed sizes. I don't have the right size here at the moment. They're all over the place. I think it's about not. I think it's a nine mil. Uh, sorry, a 10 mil drill bit in uh, shank size for there. But you can use that to hold if you don't have a um, a, a drill chuck in your tail stock as well. Just need the right shank size. Rather than go and get new ones, I know I'll stick with what I've got. I'll just use my old method. So 22 mil. <laughs> oh, 
What are you laughing at, Ben? <laughs> so, so I just, yeah, Callum's just put <laughs> with your MacGyver um, show how to make ply jaws to fit the axe mixed to wood plates at some time, please. MacGyver breach. <laughs> 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 oh, sure. so, sorry, it's another one here from Edinator. He says, um, is it needed to put is it needed to put the lathe on the low range uh, for this sort of drilling? Yeah, so high yeah don't go too fast with these. They're, they're, they're too big, these drill bits, to go too fast. So uh, I've got this at 880, so 900 it, it is fine. Yeah, don't go too quick. You'll get an awful lot of screeching and, and heating up if you do. So that's my first drill hole. That's going to take the shank. Now, all I'm going to do, I'm just going to make a cut with the with an actual lathe tool. And I'll show you why. You don't have to do this next section, but I just like to do it. I think I just find it's quite neat. Um, basically, I want to let this little section now sit inside. I don't want it protruding out. I didn't do it with this one. I don't think it looks as good. Look. So that's sticking out. You can see the white section. I want that to sink in. So we're just going to allow that to happen. You can use another drill bit if you wanted to. I'll just, because it's fairly straightforward, I'll just turn it out. So let's clean that surface first. Stop and check. I haven't measured anything. As long as it sits inside, is all we're worried about. There we go. Look at that. Perfect. So that's good. And that's sinking in far enough as well. So that's cool. We're ready to go with that one. So the last thing to do with this before we finish is create a little tenon that will sit inside the recess that we've now already turned on here. Okay. So I am going to measure that because that's important to get right. Because if you don't, you don't want the top and the bottom slopping around each other. So what I'll do is oversize the measurement with the calipers. You can just see there the top right of your screen. Stop and have a double check. Should be a big, yeah. All right, it's going on, but it's tight. We don't want it tight so that it'll screech uh, as you're using it otherwise. So a little bit of a backing off there. There we are. So that's fitting nicely, but it's not screeching. That's exactly what we want. We've got the joined look there. So we know we're at the right position. So everything's drilled in the right places. We're now ready to do the nice bit, which is the turning itself. Uh, all the surfaces that are going to be left are clean. Just needed just a little tidy up of that one. There we are. That's it. Good. Right, so next, I'm going to do a little bit more between set and turning. I want to create a, a little drive dog. So we need two centers. So if I go the same centers that we've just had, so a little revolving tailstock center. And the pro drive will take out our blank just for the minute.
Take the chuck off again, just for a minute. And I'm just going to use a bit of that, a bit of that uh, Scandinavian redwood. Which isn't red at all, but there you go. Rough down to a cylinder. There we are. And then I'm going to use a parting tool again. I want to create a whole point for the chuck. We use the little C jaws. <coughs> excuse me. Little C jaws and a little foot. Back on with the chuck. Because what we have now, look, is two blanks, one with a hole on both sides. So really, there's no way of turning that century unless we put something inside. So we're going to create a cone drive here um, and use the natural um, cone of our tailstock center to, to hold the other end. So fairly simple. Yes, Ben. Um, so uh, going back to the speed, um, the editor was talking about the belt setting. Are you in the middle there, or <laughs> I'm at fast, so I'm at the high range because uh -huh. I don't need I don't need a huge amount of torque on this. It's not a, a you know um, a, a project where we're going to give it lots of big cuts. So the high range will will, will more than cover what we need to do, even at low speed. So we're okay with that. Yeah. And then a question from Callum. He's asking if we've got any or if there's any finishing product. That will stop color color loss after processing. Mulberry lost its bright gold color after a few weeks due to UV sunlight. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, there's a certain amount of UV protection in microcrystalline wax. Um, probably the only one I know of, apart from varnishes and things like that, which state UV protection. Um, and I know uh, Osmo Oil um, has one with uh, with a, that actually states UV protection a high UV protection on it. So those sorts of things. But in terms of oils and stuff like that, not not really. Osmo, Osmo, Osmo oil goes on more like a, a varnish and whack than an oil, uh, really. You put it on with a brush and leave it to dry and all that sort of thing. So, uh, so that's the only thing I know of. And then we've got a top tip from Bob here to stop the screeching on the thing. He uses a little bit of uh, chapstick or lip salve around the, the thing and it stops it screeching. Oh, well There we are. I'll just make a little comb. Let's have a, just have a quick look and see if that goes on there. That drives nicely. Tail stock into the other end. Let's go off. Give ourselves a little bit of quill. Just want to understand exactly where I need to be careful, where I can't go too too small. And we're free to do whatever shape we want to, knowing that we're held absolutely perfectly central on that hole. Right, what shape should we do? Let's copy 
I'm going to go cove. I quite like these these shapes here, especially the way the grain uh, meets up with those look. So I'm going to do that. Nice and simple for us. That's it, nice and simple. Do I want to mess around with it? I don't really, because I'll let the timber do the talking. This is quite a pretty piece of uh, the way these these open up. It's really interesting the way you get these different Vs. Let's go take, I'll take one more cut, just because uh, I like what's happening with that pattern down the bottom. Maybe I won't do any more to that, apart from sand, of course. Yeah. This little crossover here as to what's going on, it's really interesting. So, uh, let's get that sanded up a moment, a little bit of oil. There we go. So I went to uh, four different uh, grades there. We started off with the, uh, the 150, I went to 240, 400. But then I also put in a 400 rotary sander as well, just to mix up where those uh, those angles are coming from. Now, we've got lots of different timbers in here, but the Paduk is really affecting the water. It's filled in all that grain. So I want to give it a good brush off first. So let's get my brush. Yes, Ben, have you got a question there? Um, yeah, it's a kind of, I'm not, not entirely sure about this. We've got uh, Johnny from Greece um, on. He's asking where can he buy his ac first Axminster to lave and first uh, gouges? I'm not sure. Have we got a place in Greece, a dealer in Greece? I, I'm not sure. But if, uh, Johnny, if you just email that question in, I'll talk to our ex uh, export guys and we'll confirm where the closest place to you is and if we've got mm. anywhere in Greece there's some uh, like South Spain and stuff isn't there yeah so we've got kind of Fister and stuff I don't know how close. logistically how close that is yeah. or I don't think it is that close no. but yeah let's uh, 
let's uh, uh, we'll ask the question for you. So if you could email that into Woodworking Wisdom, uh, we'll find that out for you. There's uh, lots of you know. talk about your um, your signature skew that Is people it? Are loving it and um, people wanting to buy it and love it and things like that. Love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of shied away from saying too much about it now you've been watching me for so so long um i always try and shoehorn it in somewhere <laughs> and ge genuinely only because i use it all the time yeah nice tool isn't it yeah and um so cohen there's one here from callum i'm not sure if you'd know this uh there's a concern of phil irons um that he chases his um the the thread on his urns with a with a router bit are you familiar with that? Oh, I see. He's done a couple of Instagram posts recently where, uh, yeah, he's using, it's not just a relative bit. He's using a special uh, uh, action uh, or special device to, to create that. So it's all turning in unison with each other uh, to create that uh, that actual thread size. So I don't know. He's at AEW at the moment. So when he uh, will drop an, an email or, or a message him on Instagram, that sort of thing, and he'll be able to, exactly uh, tell you what he's doing with that one but is it an actual thread cutting device that he's using i have seen it you're dead right uh ben good then. but i've got a left the blue barrel roll over there i've got no stuff to pop my uh oil on with thank you there we are so once we've done this we're just gonna match the the head section in. and then of course this is all about assembly oh look at that i'll do that nice and slowly Good coverage all over. Yeah, Ben. Go on. With the um, so a question from Medinator: Would these timbers deform with too much sanding? Um, he has that problem sometimes using holly and sapili for penguins. Yeah, you feel you sort of feel a slight difference. So density is different in different uh, timbers, of course. Um, I'm not getting that on this one at the moment. Whether that's side grain or not, I don't know. Um, but you can get it. Yeah, if you if you. Do a lot of sanding on it. And oh, I, would, I wouldn't thought too much, though, not to put people off of them. It's, uh, we feel it, of course, because we're on the lane and it's coming around. But when they're actually off the lane, you don't really feel that much. Sorry, Ben. And it's, no, sorry, I've got it in there. Um, there's people talking about your skews. They say <laughs> they got the big one and the small one. It's, do they need the middle-sized one as well? <laughs> well, you can, that's a question for yourselves, really. I can't really ask you that. If you're getting on well with those two and you don't feel that there's something missing, then carry on with them. I use the large one most of the time. My favourite one is the small one, but there are times where I just, this is too big, it's a bit cumbersome, it's getting in the way of the chuck, that sort of thing. So I need to go to a, a slightly smaller one, but the small one is just too small to get my big planning cuts in. So in those cases, that's when I'll, I'll occasionally use the middle size one. You're dead right. I mean, they're certainly the most popular are the large and small. Um, but, yeah, it's a question that you have to ask yourselves. Do you find wanting at some points, you know, some projects, do you feel you need it? Uh, I can't answer that one. I can give you a suggestion. But, uh... right, let's just move that one off. So that's the bottom already done. So now we're going to the next stage. Now I would advise, and I've put them down somewhere, I would advise making yourself, there it is, another one. Okay, this one, I've used this one for several things, including rings and stuff like that. So now we're going to grip that on that one. Okay, so just keep these. I've made this to you, uh, for you today just to show you how to make it. Once I've done it, though, I can keep that now. I can make all the uh, <coughs> excuse me, salt and pepper grinders with that one. <coughs> And the tops with this one. Got our center already. Let me just show the camera that. Got our center there for the ring center already. So that's an easy way of centering up. That's nice and centered.
Again, down to a cylinder. There we are. And I'm just going to taper. What you have to make sure, though, is you taper and you get the same diameter here as you're going to get there. So just bear that in mind. You've got to take it off and try it a couple of times. So you can see at the moment, a little bit too big. So I want to take just a, a little bit off. Well, that should be enough. Once I've done the sanding that should be okay now the top what I want to do here is just leave a little bit of material that I can cut away that will take out the whole point that we're of this uh, the ring center And so next, let's get rid of that, that center. Hopefully, that's it. That should be strong enough to hold whilst we just remove that last little bit. Get rid of some of these tools. I'm going to go to a spindle gouge now, just as a little bit friendlier to that surface. check on that make sure we're good yep that's good happy with that so now we can sand <laughs> a little bit of care here i'm going to sand but i'm going to just have that to one side if for whatever reason that does come off i don't want to go down there it'll damage my dust extractor oh yes ben question um so you touched on it earlier, Colin, but um, Callum's asking about the um, when sanding the paduk, do you get a colour bleed into the paler timber? Yeah. And, yeah, you... exactly. and we've got maple here, but the maple wasn't so much of a problem. Uh, it can be if you're using sanding sealers, and I always have a separate jar. I've, I've mentioned this before with fruit turning demonstrations. I'll have a separate jar for uh, any timbers like paduk, the ones with colour fat, um, uh, and a sanding sealer. Um, and a separate one for the paler timbers because it will colour. But on this sort of thing, as long as you uh, wipe it off with a brush before, um, then you should be okay. Because the uh, maple was a little bit more porous than the, uh, sorry, the, the walnut was a little bit more porous than the maple, the paduke was holding in the grain of the um, of the walnut. So a brush out sorted it. Um, and then from Edna, it's asking, um, is there a way to tell if... Um the skew that you're using if it's too small or too big is it just the feel or the so uh if the tools too, if the tool's too big it, it's the fact that it's it's getting in the way of other things so it's either 
a little bit too close to the chuck. Um, I'm hitting the other, if I'm rolling a bead, I'm hitting the other side of whatever feature um, is beside the bead, all those sorts of things. If um, a tool is too small, it's basically that would be the project diameter um, is, is, is very large. And so um, I'm not able easily to stay in that bottom half or bottom third of the skew, um, which you can do on a smaller diameter piece. So those are the reasons for thinking if, if a skew is too big or too small. And then one here from Martin about um, a Purple Heart. Um, any tips for bringing out the colour of Purple Heart? Uh, dear, don't put it in the direct sunlight too early, otherwise you'll get it cracking all over the place. Uh, so, uh, no, what you just have to expose it to UV. That's that's the only thing. So once you've turned it, so you'll probably buy a blanket and it's deep, deep purple, lovely. You turn it and it's quite grey and quite horrible looking. Literally leave it a few hours. As a, well, I'll say a few hours, maybe a couple of days, and then you'll find that it will start to go pink, uh, sorry, more purple and purple uh, as each day comes. Until you get to a few years, and then like every other timber, it all goes grey at the end. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's do some sanding. Very, very basic shape, this one, but uh, it works. There we are. That was the 150, so we're going on to 240. Four hundred. That's it. Give it a bit of a brush out. Bit of an oil, sand it in. And then just buff it up. There's, there's the lid. Together, I'll have to find where it matches now. We know we've got it around the right way. There we are. Look at that. That's that's lovely. The way those sort of angles come in together. All right. So that worked rather well in that shape. So next thing to do is just pop the mechanism in itself. Now, I've made a couple of little devices for this. First of all, this one. So this is going to hold the top. So if you've got a rounded top or a square top, that works really well. So that's why we bash in the, the other one. Uh, so the top uh, section. And then if we turn that over, that could go over there. A hole all the way down through that little device. That's so that when you push these through, this doesn't clout anything because that's directly contacting the ceramic area of that, uh, of that section there. So that will slot in. Next thing, I need to hit this in. I don't want to hit the ceramic, so I'm going to hit. I'm going to use this that goes over the ceramic, but hits the outer area, and then I can hit that with my mallet 
and I know I'm doing it safely and not going to damage anything. Um, one thing I haven't done, which you can do, you can buy yourself an actual side cutting uh, slot cutter to cut inside a little recess in here and in the lid that then allows these lugs here to bite into, okay, both on that and on the top section. Okay, the top section here. And the reason they're there is because you're continually taking the thing apart to put peppercorns in or salt rocks in. Okay, and you can start putting this out over time. Uh, so it is wise. If you're going to make a lot of them, I would certainly consider that. But let's get the mechanisms in first. So that will end up coming all the way through. Look, so I'm just making sure that sits over the hole. That can sit over there. We'll punch him all the way in. There we are, until it hits the bottom. That's it. So we've got that protruding out. And then in the top, same thing. Watch your finger. Oh. I was just about to say, watch your fingers. Um, the amount of times I've got my fingers on those, so let's just be a little bit more careful. All the way down. Now, that's what I meant about that that not protruding out. Much better if that's cut flush so you can't see it. There we are. So that's locked in there nicely. All I have to do now is join the two together. There we are. Tightly and bring him round. Where did he meet up? There we are. So there we've got that nice little join there now. Look. And he got a working working salt pepper grinder or salt or pepper grinder. So let me just before we leave for the day, I'll get all the different shapes. That's a nice sort of matching shape to that one. And this one here. Where, where the best place to be there is maybe the main camera number one then with that that sorts of show them a little bit nice little family all from the same off cuts um, but it's just giving you a different idea of uh, of sizes shapes and all that sort of thing uh, that was done for the mini then we go to the 130 uh, and then up to the 190s uh, those both the 130s even though they're slightly different lengths i've just used a different um, different amount of timber in, in those two but yeah, I hope that's given you a few ideas. Any more questions, Ben? No, I think we're all clear now. Um, yeah, some nice hips and tips. Lots of uh, people saying thank you and, 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 and lots of love for the skew today. Excellent. <laughs> we'll have to get a skew, a skew demo going again at some point. Okay, well, look, thanks everybody for stopping by again and watching. Um, I think it's all me in the next couple of uh, couple of woodworking wisdoms. I've got a Father's Day uh, project on Thursday for you. It's a recorded one uh, because it's not wood turning, so it's out of my comfort zone a little bit. It's just a little bit of wall art. And then next week, next, on Tuesday, again, unfortunately, I won't be here. I'm prepping to go on the wood turning cruise over in Norway with my, my boy Finn, Nick Agar, Neil Turner, or loads of other wood turners. Uh, for uh, to cruise the fjords so i'll um i won't be here but i'm doing a recorded or i've done a recorded um a pen demonstration for you that's with an americana pen using a corn cob uh, as the material and we've dyed the corn cob and we're going to use a ca finish we stabilize with ca glue as well um to make a lovely sort of snake skin effect uh, americana pen so don't forget to join on uh, tuesday of next week uh, thanks ever so much, everybody. Uh, don't forget, if you like what you see, give us a thumbs up, uh, share us around with all your friends, and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, see you again. Bye-bye.